Hello and welcome to Betty King International Ministries. My name is Pastor Oliver. Our senior pastor, Reverend Betty King, sends her warmest greetings. Today, I'm going to be dealing with the topic of anger. Yes, you heard me, the topic of anger. Our anchor scripture is taken from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 to 27. I'm going to read two different versions. New King James Version says this, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. I love the Passion Translation, which says, But don't let the passion of your emotions lead you to sin. Don't let anger control you or be fuel for revenge. Not even for a day. Don't give the slanderous accuser, the devil, an opportunity to manipulate you. I just love these definitions. The first point, I only have three points for you today, but the first point is this. It says, be angry, but do not sin. It's it's a very common misconception. It says, be angry. It's okay to be angry. It's a human emotion. It's normal. Be angry. God gave you that emotion, but there is a condition attached. It says, be angry, but do not sin. The word used to describe Anger here is taken from the Aramaic word ragza, and it means to tremble, to shake with furor, with anger. And and God is saying, it's okay to be angry, but don't be so enraged that it leads you to do something that you will regret. In fact, we read of God getting angry so many times in the Bible. But it seems that the biggest distinction between man's anger and God's anger is this. What is God angry about? What is man angry about? And what does that anger ultimately lead to? It seems as though God often gets angry at sin, whereas man gets angry at the inconvenience of sin. Let me explain. I'm gonna take a scripture from Genesis chapter four, uh, the story of Cain and Abel, which many of you know, but I'm reading from verses three to eight, and it says this. In the process, this is an example of man's anger. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, well, sin lies at the door. And its desire, listen to this, is for you. But you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with his brother Abel. And it came to pass that they were in the field one day. And Cain rose up against Abel. And he killed his brother. So anger was fine to the point where he was able to have a conversation with God to process it. And God gave him some really great advice. But nonetheless, he carried that anger. And he ended up striking his brother and committing murder. What was he angry at? What did that anger lead to? Fundamentally, he was angry because God accepted his brother's offering. His brother gave a pure offering from a good heart of the first fruit. His offering, on the other hand, wasn't from the right heart. And the Bible doesn't allude to it being of his first fruit. And out of that, he's angry and he ends up going all the way and killing his brother. Here's a godly example of anger taken from Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 to 14. And it says this, Then Jesus went into the temple of God and he drove out all of those who had bought and sold in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made this a house of a den of thieves. Then the blind came and the lame came to the temple and they were healed. What was Jesus angry at and what did it lead to? Jesus was angry at the fact that His father's house had been uh, polluted, had been sullied. His father's house had been um, overturned. It wasn't being used for prayer. It wasn't being used to minister. But what was the fruit of that action, that righteous anger? Well, fundamentally, it says once the temple was restored, it says the blind came, the lame came, and they were healed. And so you see two parallels, two examples of man's anger, which leads to death, and God's anger, which leads to life. So that's the first point. So I want to pause at this point. I want to pray for anybody who has experienced and experiences this rags up, this uncontrollable shaking anger, this temper. Maybe it's road rage. 
Maybe it's to the point where you're speaking words that you regret to your wife, your spouse, your partner, your colleagues, your friends, your bosses, your leaders. Uh, um, maybe it's on the road, as I say, where you just end up tooting your horn and, and for a split second you, you've forgotten that this thing is overtaking you and it leads you to sin. I want to pray for all of you who experience this type of anger. So Heavenly Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we ask the Lord for your help in dealing with this uncontrollable anger, dealing with this rage, dealing with this temper that overtakes us, overwhelms us, and it doesn't stop there. It leads us to do something that we regret. And it's become a cycle. We're unable to stop it. We're unable every single time. We mean well, but this spirit overtakes us. This spirit causes us to do things that aren't Christian, that don't reflect you well. We ask for your forgiveness. Holy Spirit, we ask for your intervention. Give us a righteous anger that leads to life, not the kind of anger that leads to death. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, moving on to the second point. The second part of Ephesians 4 verses 26 to 27 says this, it says, do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Here's the thing, what it's trying to say is that, or what it is saying is that anger festers and the longer you leave it, the worse it gets. What's more, it's saying that anger is actually transferable. Let me read this scripture from Numbers chapter 20 verses 5 to 8 and it says, and why have you made us come up out of Egypt? This is the Israelites grumbling against Moses when they've uh, run out of water. To bring us to this evil place. It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of God to, uh, to the assembly, the door of the tabernacle, the meeting, and they fell on their faces. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take the rod, you and your brother Aaron and go to the congregation together listen to this it says speak to the rock before their eyes and it will yield water thus you shall bring water out of the rock and give it to them the congregation and the animals to drink notice how God says to Moses I want you to speak to the rock but actually Moses it says struck the rock. He was so angry with the complaints of the people. That fury carried, it was transferred. Listen to this. He had a conversation with the people who were grumbling. He was at his last nerve. He's able to go into the presence of God, come out and directly disobey God, which means he took that anger. It festered. He took it into the presence of God, out of the presence of God and disobeyed God. What was he angry at? The people who grumbled. What did it lead to? It ultimately led to him missing out on taking the people into the promised land. After all of those years, after being called the most humble man on earth, after being called a friend of God, he missed out on fulfilling, physically at least, taking the people of Israel into the promised land. The Bible says when his eyes were still bright and his body was still strong, the Lord took his life. The Lord took his life. So he never fulfilled the mandate. And so I really want to say to you, do not let the sun go down whilst you're still angry. Resolve it quickly. Don't let pride get in the way. Don't miss out on your promise. Don't miss out on what God has for you because you're angry. That is the enemy's ploy. Perhaps you've had a tough day in work and you're angry at your boss or your colleagues. Don't come home and place that anger on your wife or your spouse or friends or colleagues, children. Deal with it at work before you even come home. Don't transfer that anger. Don't forget, it's transferable. If you don't deal with it before you go to sleep, it can follow you into your dreams. You can carry that stress through your subconscious into your dreams and it can really sully perhaps the message or whatever God may want to communicate to you at night. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Deal with it very quickly. Have a conversation. Don't be proud about it. One last thing before we pray. Interestingly, even though Moses disobeyed God, interestingly, water still came out of the rock. God still honored his promise. And sometimes I felt the Lord saying that sometimes we have a tendency to justify our gift just because the miracle happened and the water came out of the rock, 
God didn't forget that. He still supplied and he fed the people, but ultimately Moses missed out on his promise. So there is a tendency when things are going well for us to justify anger that we might be carrying deal with it. Let's deal with it quickly. And so I want us to take a moment to pray. And the first prayer point simply is this, Lord, arrest any pride where we're holding on to anger that we need to deal with and deal with quickly. Arrest that spirit of pride that stops us from dealing with that anger. And anger has been known to give all kinds of uh, health issues. It's been known to give the enemy a foothold. It's been known to delay seasons and cause many to miss out on those seasons. But Lord, arrest pride. Help us have conversations with our colleagues, with our spouses, our wives, our friends, our co- you know, help us to have those conversations quickly. The Bible says, even before you enter the presence of God, lay your gift down, go and make amends with your brother or your sister, then come back and present your gift onto the Lord. So help us, Lord, not to make light of your presence. In Jesus' name, and Lord, also forgive us where we have justified anger because of whatever reason, pride or our gifting or because things appear to be going well. And maybe where we even have been wrongly justified, you may say. Help us still, Lord, lay this down before your feet. Help us lay it down at your feet. Help us entrust it to you. For after all, after all you say, vengeance is yours. Justice is yours. We give it on to you. But forgive us, Lord, where we have justified carrying this anger for so long. And right now, we choose to lay it down at your feet. We choose to lay it down at the foot of the cross. We choose to apply the blood of Jesus. We choose to lean on the finished work of the cross. In Jesus' name. And my final point, and the point number three is this. The enemy's intention, it says in verse 27, is for anger to get a place in you. For the enemy to get a foothold. For the enemy to get a stronghold, a legal right to steal your season, to cause you to miss out to cause you to, to, to lose out on what God has planned for you. Ephesians 4 verse 27 from the Passion Translation says this, I love it. It says, don't give the slanderous accuser, the devil, an opportunity to manipulate you. Cain killed his brother and he was marked for death. Moses killed out of anger. And the Bible says he had to spend 40 years in the wilderness. Again, he, 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 he strikes the rock instead of speaking to the rock. What happens? He never gets to see the promised land. We see another account of Moses being angry when he spent 40 days and 40 nights in the presence of God, top of Mount Canaan. He comes down with the glory of the Lord, but he sees that golden idol. What does he do? He snaps the commandments in half. He breaks the word of God. And what God gave to him supernaturally, he has to lay before. He has to take a chisel, chisel that stone, that rock out, go back up the mountain, see the process all through again. And ultimately, nobody from that generation sees the promised land. It was really sad. The enemy was able to manipulate Moses time and time again through this spirit of anger that he partnered with, even though he was in and out of the presence of God. And so I want us to pray finally. Lord, I pray that no more seasons would be stolen out of this spirit of anger. I plead with you that whatever the canker worm has stolen, give it back to us. The Bible says where the enemy has been caught, he has to pay back sevenfold, a hundredfold, the entire possessions of his household. We ransack the camp of the enemy and we take back everything that's been stolen. Every promise that's been taken or stolen because of this angry spirit, we demand it back right now in the name of Jesus Christ. No one, you will not miss another season because of anger in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have taught us today. Thank you, Lord, for what your scripture says. Thank you, Lord, for the repentance that has taken place through everybody watching this video. And we pray, Lord, help us to move in righteous anger. Help us to move with a spirit of joy. Help us to move and trusting that you will see justice and vengeance through. We bless you. We give you all the praise and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching this video. I would encourage you to share it with your friends, with your family. Watch it over and read the scriptures. Perhaps the Lord will give you even more revelation. I also want to encourage you to watch True Fine Stories. There is an episode on anger which is so beautifully depicted by our drama team. Thank you so much again for tuning in. God bless you and we'll see you for the next episode. Goodbye.